Praise the Lord. Let's just stand look to the Lord this morning. Is there a prayer request? I re- realize there is people in the hospital, people being sick, and we sure need that healing campaign they had in the 50s. But we can look towards the Lord. We can pray and ask that the Lord would move on uh, on the behalf of, t- of those that have need, not only just in body, but sometimes it's in our minds or as we got battles going on too as well. Let's all pray th- this morning. So. Yes, yes. Yes, Sister, McCl- uh, Sister York is coming a bit along some there. Yeah. All right, Heavenly Fathers, we come before thy throne of grace. Lord, we think about Brother McLeod, Lord, Sister York, and Brother York, Brother Bob Kiln's uh, son. There are many others, Lord, that have need a touch from thee. And Lord, we approach thy throne of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we would come into the service, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would be, Lord, blessed in the song service and every part of it, Lord, that you would have your way. And Lord, we remember this morning, Lord, thy nation Israel as well. Lord, now we commit the service in your hands. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody this morning. I'm looking at one, 189 in the little blue book here. Do you guys have that in the back of your chairs? Uh, I'll be somewhere. I'll be listening. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably in the big book. I don't know where. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior somewhere listening for my name I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening for my name I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere Listening for my name If my heart is right When he calls me If my heart is right I will hear If my heart is right When he calls me I'll be somewhere Listening Listening for my name I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening for my name If my robe is white when he calls me If my robe is white Listening for my name I'll be 
this morning? 58. You guys want to start it?
a little longer and the trump of God will sound just a little longer and we'll all be glory bound no go away to Jesus our redemption God just a little longer and we'll meet him in the sky A little longer And the trump of God will sound Just a little longer And we'll all be glory bound Lord, go away to Jesus Our redemption in the red book <clears throat> thank you Lord yep. okay. start it
Do you have a song this morning? And Crystal, do you have a song afterwards? The battle is his victory. 
mine and victory is sweet yes I see a great band of angels camped all around me I see the captain rising up to challenge to me Yes, I see a great band of angels camped all
special grace to you. I know that I was never, never worthy. My sins demanded that I be punished too. But then I heard that Jesus took my place on Calvary And His very special grace was there to see me through special grace to you. It's time to leave it 
It's good. 
I just want to thank the Lord this morning. Just don't know where I'd be without him. And the struggles of life, you know. At times it's just not a picnic. And uh, I'm just thankful that the Lord came into my life when he did. From day to day, I just look. Uh, the stress of life. On this job site that I'm on, this past week, there's been one guy's younger than, my, than me, and another fellow's just a couple years older, and uh, we had two heart attacks. And. I'm sure a lot of it is the way of things of life today brings upon a lot of stress that's not needed. For those that are of age, that I'm sure if we would go back to the way of life 60, 70 years ago, would have been a lot less stress. I just don't know what I would do today. What I would have in the Lord in my life. I'm thankful that he, he's there. I've not, have always been 100% faithful to him. As Paul has described, that he dies daily. And he repents. And as I look at my walk, I definitely have been there. But I am truly thankful that he called and he brought me into this picture. I know it's been mentioned at this pulpit before. There are there's churches that we can go to that they just preach a really happy sermon to uplift the people. I know in my heart this morning that if that's all I would look and would have had through these years, very unlikely I'd be standing here this morning. It's been the word of God that has upheld me through the good times and through the bad, mostly. I know it's easy to mix our emotions and feelings. With the love of God. It is easy to let those feelings show and the bad one as well mostly that we can let ourselves get to a place and just completely explode. I'm just thankful that the Lord is helping me. In the times of trouble, I've really appreciated the songs that's been sang this morning. Touch my heart. I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters, for prayers and that we are here and not pull one another. I'm thankful for Fred and Ray that withstood the times. I am certainly positive that it's not an easy thing to stand here every Sunday morning and minister with the things that have been happening and the years that's gone by. There's been a lot of things that's gone under the bridge since Raymond Jackson has left the scene. And it, it causes each one of us to really realize that Jesus Christ paid the price and, and it's written in the word through these past years, I've heard many statements 
said that it's just a book. Maybe there's been mistakes. There's been none. Clearly says in Revelation to whom if they take away from it or add to it. Well, that's pretty plain to me. And that is none other but the Spirit of God that is instilled into me that when I finally picked that book up, it sat on the shelf and collected dust, but it became real and live. And that is that comforter that came. He promised that he would. And when he entered into my soul and my body, that it changed my outlook. And I know there have been statements said through the years, the Baptist of the Holy Ghost and setting you on fire, but I can clearly tell you this morning that we've each had our experiences, and the one that I've had, no one can take it away from me. And I know that that comforter is none other than Jesus Christ came into my soul it made me whole I'm just thankful that I'm here this morning well down this road and I can see a bright light shining for me it's far away but the pull is strong But someday this old road won't be so long And when that morning finally gets here When I reach my journey's end I'll be waiting at the gate for him open up and let me in. I've seen a lot of signs that have led me to this place. And I know I'm on the right way to the day where I shall see his face. When that morning finally gets here, when I reach my journey's end, I'll be waiting at the gate for him to open up and let me in down this road. I can see a bright light shining. For me, it's far away, but the pull is strong. But someday this old road won't be so long. And when that morning finally gets here, And I'll be waiting at the gate for him to open up and let me in. I have passed a lot of signs that have led me 
to this place and I know I'm on the right way to the day where I shall see his face when that morning finally got here and when I read my journey's end I'll be waiting at the gate for him to open up and let me in about eternal security. So I really appreciate the Lord for this new life because that's what it is. It's an eternal security. Yes. We're in God's hands. Yeah. We're safe and secure in Him. Yeah. His grace is sufficient. We were talking about that on the way here this morning, how uh, Lord always makes a way. You can make all the plans you want. You're going to do this and that, and or you're hoping to do this and that, but many times they fall true. And uh, I think the Lord is schooling us these last days. And uh, I'm thankful for His grace. He never drops the ball, so I'm just thankful this morning. Anybody else got something on their hearts before I turn the service over? The house of the Lord and the songs of Zion. You know, it's a Christmas season, and you hear so many Christmas songs, and of course, being in the field of work, I am, uh, you hear a lot of it. But there's this particular French one that the kids like so much, Petit Papa Noël. And those of you that don't know, it's before you uh, close your eyelids, you say a last prayer, Petit Papa Noël, you know who that is, and then when he comes down from the sky. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thankful that we are looking for a different one to come yeah. from the sky. And yesterday I had the little ones over my house, and usually, before we eat, I would ask them if anybody has something they want to pray, and usually they're too shy. But yesterday, all four of them wanted to express their thankfulness to the Lord in their little own way, and it was such a blessing to me. And they I kept going on. And even one, he even expressed the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that those that are raised up in the ways of the mm -hmm. Lord, because they're surely going to need him in the yes. years to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Jesus.
morning when I came downstairs and I was sitting at the table. I'm going to read the Bible. And uh, I had some things on my heart that I was, I guess, troubled about. And I opened the Bible and this piece of paper was right there. And uh, a sister had given me the poem. I believe Neil might have written it, but I just would like to say it today. It just spoke to my heart. It says, Hush, my child, though the storms would beat about thee, listen to thy God that lives so deep within thee. My peace do I leave to thee. Fear not the blowing gale. My presence shall go with thee yes. within that sacred veil. Come, my child, apart from all the din, about thee into my presence, where nothing shall alarm me. My wall have not I caused it to surround thee. My peace and safety are within the sacred veil. Believe, my child, that the Lord is mindful of thee. There is no storm that blocks my vision of thee. Toil on, for I am deep within thee when thou will come with me within that sacred faith. And I thought it was beautiful. Well, praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Heavenly Father, as we come at this part of the service, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for thy leading in our lives in the hour that we live in. And Lord, wherever we look into your word, Lord, I just pray, use this vessel of clay as you would see fit. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the things that you've allowed us to see. And Lord, I just pray strengthen us as we go on in the days ahead. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We see it this morning. I'm going to continue on in Knowing the Time, part three, if you want to. And we're looking at things leading up to the coming of the Lord. And we're getting closer, not because someone says we're getting closer, but as God takes his word and starts opening things up, nearing the time that we're going to be at, to live at, then we ought to realize by the revelation of the word of God that we're getting near to go home. And like all the songs, the first song this morning, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Well, it's, it's one thing to listen for your name, but you have to know when. Because if you think it's a far off, you could be listening. You, in your, the, denom the denomination in their mind, it, they, can, they might think it's tomorrow, it could be 100 years. But we know... Well, we know because God has opened things up to us in this hour that we live in. Starting from that familiar scripture in Matthew chapter 16. Verse 2, Matthew 16, verse 2. Again, this sets as a type. of those that don't see their day. And the reason that there are in every generation those that don't see their day is because they have preconceived ideas or they've learned something of the past and has not seen how God has grown the revelation and hang on to the past. But hanging on, it's good to know what God has done in the past of different truths. 
But then if God expounds on it, then we must move on into the truth that he has expounded for the hour that we live in or the hour that a person may live in. Because otherwise, you just end up being stopping there at the fence and you're just going to go in circles with what you have kept back then. And I know it's so easily done. Uh, when we first came into the message, or as we would come into the message, as, as God brings a real nugget. Now, I'm not talking about salvational nugget. Those things are, are needful, very precious, never diminish those things in any shape, way, or form. But when it came to, he had opened up certain things, like being a Catholic, when I, when the Lord brought me in and I was saved and received the Spirit, there was no such thing as a millennium. There was no such thing as the day of the Lord, the 70 weeks of Daniel, all these things. But yet, from the early days of the 70s, God has not just revealed something, but he's also elaborated on it. If I stay back there, then I need some eyesight to see as God opens a bit more and more understanding of revelation as we move on in time. But here is a classical example of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they were approaching Jesus, and they came tempting him. They didn't come to wanting to know. If they came tempting him, because they already had a spirit, an anti-spirit to begin with. And that's what the spirit of Antichrist will do. It'll come to tempt you. Well, what about that? What do you think? Or trying to catch, like they, most often when Jesus was walking they try, here on earth, they tried to catch him in what he was doing. But in, the, and in this parable here he says, And he answered unto them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of, of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. And so is it with every move of God, especially when God moves from one servant to another servant or from one area to another area. It's very difficult. It's more difficult for those that just came out of what they're from to move into what God is doing at the hour that you're living in. So this morning, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25, verse 13... I'll just read that verse for now. Watch therefore, for you know not, neither the day or the hour, when the Son of Man cometh. So in this parable, as it unfolds from verse 1 on down, it shows in verse 1 that the turn of the century when the Holy Ghost was, was poured out, those early Believers that received the Spirit of God speaking in tongues, they felt they must be coming near to the Lord's coming because we have the same thing as the apostles and the early church had. But then it goes on to say in verse 2, And then the five of them were wise and five were foolish. But they that were foolish took their lamp and took no oil with them. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. That brings you now from the 1900s to after World War II. At midnight, there was a cry made, and behold, a bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now, what does that mean? The bridegroom's coming. 
It's another word or illustration. Watch, because something's going about to happen. And so the cry was really to be made ready for the Lord to come. That is your Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6b, where Brother Bram fulfilled that part concerning restoring back the uh, basic gospel doctrines of baptism of the Holy Spirit, the predestination, and so forth, restoring what the early church had back to the church. So that was the cry. Now, sometimes when I go from the cry to the shout, some think it's just a, a line that just stops there. There is an overlapping of these things when God moves from one program to the other. Because from the cry, when, he, when the Lord used Brother Branham to restore back the apostolic doctrines back to the face of our forefather, he started preaching the 70 weeks of Daniel in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. He preached the church ages in 1960. But these things that he was speaking about, they were doctrines that he was bringing in more of a revelation to it. It was partly restoring and it was partly settling those revelations in place. Because there were denominational churches that believe in church ages. There was denominational church that believed there was a 70 weeks of the week of Daniel, but they didn't know how to put it together. Some believed it all happened till the time of Jesus and so forth. There was different doctrines of it. And so when Brother Brandon picks it up now, he's leading, to, you're going from 1960 or 5960, leading to 1963. But then in 1963, something definitely happened. God spoke because one trump, God speaking, and revealed six seals. So there was an, uh, a moving of, of the gifts in the, from the 50s. When it came near the 60s, now God is, those gifts started to abate. And now the words started to come into play till you hit 1963. And 1963, it brings you to the verse 10. So from, 1940, from 1947 to 1963, verse 6 to verse 9 occupies that space of time. Now remember, this parable is not made, it's the Lord looking over the whole generation and using an illustration or a parable to show the conditions that are transpiring over time as the bride it's moving into that period of time where he's going to be calling her in to come into to that room. All right. So in verse 10, he says, While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. That's the key. The word, the bridegroom came, that means he's here. He's not here physically, but he's here in a revelatory message. He came to us in a message. Yet Jesus was still sitting on the throne of glory. But he came to us now. He's speaking in a prophetic manner. Fulfilling Revelation chapter 19 around verse 10. That's the spirit of prophecy. Because from now on. Now God, the Lord is going to be speaking in a prophetic manner. How many follow? So when the bridegroom came. Now, there's a few things, because I want to go over some things that is involved in that verse 10. It was in 1963, or 62, a lot of major things as far as when we're looking at God's word, things took place. Yes, in 63... God anointed a prophet to speak six seals. And we know beyond a shadow of doubt, he said when there was, it was one trump, God spoke. But in 1962 now, in the world, 
and we talked about this on, on Thursday night, how that in the world had come to the brink of nuclear war. I remember on TV they were saying, before this time came, it was five minutes to midnight. Yeah, for you, it's this way. Five minutes to midnight. Well, when the Cuban crisis came, and the B-52 bombers were flying overhead, and they were within two minutes of non-return, and the Russian submarine, which we didn't realize till only in the last five years or ten years, it's been brought to surface. He had a conventional submarine, yes, but he had a nuclear-tipped torpedo. And he was given the permission to fire that thing, but thing by the Russian leaders. Yet, when it came time, instead of firing it, he decides to surface. That would have started World War III immediately. So, now the writers put down, it was no longer five minutes to, now it was only a few seconds before midnight. The world is, was talking about a midnight hour. Now, I've got three watches here, but I'm going to use another picture to maybe illustrate what I'm trying to say this morning. From six in the evening to six in the morning, that's, it's not on. Oh, the projector didn't get there. Oh, that's why you can't see a thing. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Plug it in, plug it out, baby. Well, there we go. Now you're in tune. Anyway, the other one is the uh, chart that I used before. In when it's evening time, or the the twelve hours for the nighttime season season of the Earth, when the Earth goes through that dark period of time. It starts from 6 o'clock in the evening till 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, some say that is a general statement that is, is used. Because, yeah, you could be here in the North America when, when we're close to the sun and uh, you've got a shorter day and down south below the equator is a longer day. But as the average, it's from 6 to 6. And so the watches... We have to look at it in the terms how it was in the days of Jesus. And in the days of Jesus, prior to that time, the Grecian Empire had instituted in their military four watches for the night. So their soldiers wouldn't, wouldn't be one soldier watching all night trying to stay awake. Because if you're, stay, if you're in there constantly looking and watching... Uh, militarily, it's strangeful on your eyes and so forth. And so to get them alert, they would only allow them to, to go about three hours. The reason I'm saying that, and the Romans did the same thing, even at sea during World War II, they had the same things. Now, the first one, it starts at evening, right? When you're looking at Matthew chapter 25 verse 1 to about verse 5. That's your evening time. The, there were songs sung about this is the evening time. The light is growing dimmer and dimmer and so forth. Those are songs, but actually, it, if you want to, I'm just, it, I'm just looking between the lines here. Matthew 25, verse 1 to verse 5, would be your evening time period coming to from the 1900s to about the time Brother Branham steps on the scene. Then from 9 p.m. to 12, it's what you call your midnight watch because it's leading up to midnight. So far, so good? So now when we come into verse 6, at midnight it was a cry, in, in the midnight watch came that cry. 
till he came to the end of that watch in 62 or 63, even the world said it was midnight because we, I know God's word wouldn't have allowed a nuclear war to take place because the scripture couldn't be fulfilled. But that is your midnight hour time. Now when you reach the midnight hour, because each of these four areas, if you want to, the evening time is not considered a watch, it's just the evening time. Because we're going to look in Luke, it talks about a second watch and a third watch. Well, where's the first watch? It's in Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. He says, watch therefore, for you know not the hour the Lord is coming. It is in Matthew 25 that talks about at midnight was a cry. So it's in that first watch is the, is actually the midnight, from the midnight cry on that is involved in it. But when it came to the time that Brother Branham passes off the scene, God now brings an apostle and it's through the first night watch or the second watch after midnight, if you want, the first watch after midnight. And he's bringing things on ground. Now, when I mentioned that Brother Branham, God has used him through the, the seals and other things that he brought forth, we got to know how close we were getting to the end, but yet there was not enough details to know how close we were going as far as decades or seasons is concerned. Because when Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 13, or sorry, in, in, uh, in Acts 1 and 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, not for you to know the centuries or the decades. But if he said that, that means to them it was not to be made known, but there would be a people that would know when the decades are coming to a close, the, se- the uh, centuries would come to a close, and the decades would, st- be- would come into play. Now, in the days of Brother Branham, he knew about First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. He preached it in, in a lot of his message. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God. But Brother Branham, in, a, in some of the ser- most of the sermons I've looked at in his sermons, he took the voice of the archangel was for the dead. which God had allowed him to say those things. Now you're in the second watch at the time where Brother Jackson is now on the scene. And God now as gets him to pick up 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He makes us to see that that voice of the archangel is not for the dead, but it's for the living. So we got to see more clearly in the revelatory aspect Concerning things, concerning to watch for his coming. Is that? All right. Maybe I'll... So there is a third watch. The third watch is the hour that we're living in. And that third watch is under the fivefold ministry. And you know when that third watch... The fivefold ministry, you're back to the morning. There's songs sung about, will rise in the morning. I don't think they're all out, out of whack. Because when morning comes and all those songs there, we will rise, we will we'll be with the Lord. In a time frame, you're looking at what the fivefold ministry is going to be involved in, in knowing some things that would lead now, not only knows that we're in decades, but will be in the terms of even months or weeks even. All right.
But I want to go, still stay in Matthew chapter 25 this morning. I know we read this scripture a lot. And in verse 10, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. Now, since you're all seasoned believers, and we know that When we go up in the rapture, there's a wedding supper. Where does the marriage take place? Down here. Before we go up. Now remember, it's a bride that's made up of people. That is going to be the bride. So when she went in behind that door and the door was closed, it's not a door that she's hiding from somebody, but it's a door of revelation is closed to any other so-called make-believers, tears, and, well, not, it's closed to your foolish virgins. They can't enter in, so it's not a physical door. But while she is going in there to be made, to be made ready, is a process of time. And in this process of time, while she goes in there, because that's from 1963 till the rapture. And when does she get married? The minute in 1963 someone comes in and he just have a few things. Now, I'm not, you can look at it as an individual, but we have to look at it as a body. She is not complete yet. It's like a bride going to a wedding. She only got one shoe on, half of the veil on, and huffing out the door to get married. No, the bride gets herself completely ready to go, right? So therefore, at, now remember, don't look at it as an individual, but this is the bride itself of Christ, which is, is a body of people. As that body of people now from 1963, now is putting on the final touches of her revelatory dress. And when she has come to perfection, and she's fully made ready and dressed, she's ready for the wedding. Uh, yeah, the marriage. So the marriage takes place down here. The Bible says we don't go up to be married and then the wedding supper. The wedding supper is like the honeymoon. They, we go and go with the Lord Jesus Christ to glory in the spirit world for that wedding supper. And we know that wedding supper is not a big long table that people's going to be sitting in there. And, and when you start, when we start looking at those things, we know that the bride is more than a thousand or two thousand people. It looks more like a hundred million people or fifty million people. So where are you going to put the? Where are you going to sit? How close you can get to Jesus? Is this? It. It's been there all along. On things that was concerning where the marriage takes place, but because we've been looking at certain other avenues. We sort of like, it's like left there untouched for a while. But now we need to know when are we going to be, when the bride as a whole going to be married. Now when you and I received the Holy Ghost, we were a spouse to one husband. The word. And the bride is to put on that word. So when is the bride going to come to her completion? When is she putting on not just a word that she has a lot of word been revealed, but she is not complete yet. Maybe she didn't polish her shoes or haven't got the veil, the uh, 
I don't know however you want to look at it in, in those terms. I'm just using that as an illustration. But somewheres, when the bride's going to be made ready, and she's going to be married to her husband, I can see this morning using things that God uses as parallels when that miracle war starts to take place Israel will have all her land and her temple. About that time, the bride should come to her completion. We shouldn't start thinking in our mind, well, I'm going to wait till out here to get ready after Ezekiel 38 and 39. And in this time frame, from the time from 2005, in that third watch, as the five-fold ministry is now on ground, I have to bring in Luke chapter 19 this morning. Now, to those that are listening by the internet, if this is the first time, I suggest you listen to that message last Sunday, part two, to know more about the first watch, second watch, and the third watch. But I'm just bringing in more information concerning these watches. And the main watch we're looking for is the third watch. Why would the Lord in in two parables say, here's a watch in Matthew 25, and in Luke chapter 12, there's a second watch, and then there's a third watch. Right off the bat, spiritually speaking, he's not coming to pick us up in the second watch, but he is definitely going to be dealing with us, and that's during the ministry of Brother Jackson. But in the third watch, now if they're going to be watching, if it's just Brother Jackson's message, we need it, and that's all there is, then there would be no need of a third watch or a further depth in revelation of the Word of God. So in Luke chapter 19 now, verse 12. He speaks of a parable. He's pointing out a condition. And this parable will go from the second watch to the third watch. And a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This nobleman is none other but the Lord Jesus Christ. When has he returned? In the shout of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And in that shout, that started in 1963. Yes, it was initiated by Brother Branham for a short space of time. But the thing that come to be delivered, we'll see here in, verse, in the following verse, in verse 13. And he called... His ten servants. That's another clue showing to you and I, this parable doesn't belong in the first church age. There was twelve disciples there. But here is ten, which goes along with the parable of Matthew chapter 25, where there's five wise and five foolish. That's here at the end time. So now as he calls these ten servants... He delivers them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. When and how were those pounds delivered? It was initiated, if you want to, in one sense, Brother Branham introduced it in his in that first watch, which was just a short space of time near the end. But that those ten pounds, which is not some weight to be distributed to people, but it's the weight of the revelation of the Word of God. And this came through the ministry of Brother Raymond Jackson 
of those many revelations that he is, that God used him to bring to us. Now remember, we quote his brother Jackson, but it's actually the Lord Jesus Christ. He sends an angel to send down to teach and to instruct and to motivate the servant on ground to bring whatever he, the Lord wants him to reveal in that hour. So occupy till I come. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So it's while the pounds were being delivered. That process started in that period of time. And these citizens, I remember when in the 70s and the 80s when I seen that scripture, I thought it was the nation of Israel. It is not. It is the citizens of the country in which the nobleman has come from. That's where the revelated word of God is being displayed. And in there, there would be ten servants. Five wives, five foolish. And in the servants, not all servants are true servants. And we see it played out on ground when Brother Jackson came on the scene and he started preaching the word that the majority of those that were under Brother Branham's ministry hated him. They didn't hate him because he did something to them. He preached something that was contrary to their spirit, which is an antichrist spirit. And that's why they didn't want him to, they don't want, they didn't want him to rule over him. It's not Brother Jackson ruling, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It, see, the Bible says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh from heaven. Jesus spoke on earth in 33 AD. He dealt spiritually from the throne concerning the early church with the Apostle Paul and so forth. But then the Lord did not speak in any revelatory manner till it comes to 1963. So the one that's speaking from heaven today is none other but the Lord that's speaking from heaven. That's where he's speaking from. He's speaking a message. So to refuse what God was putting on ground, those people that are opposed say, no, there's no such thing as the sea of glass. No, the hell's not, hell's not eternal. Hell is eternal. Or all these other things are, are the, the three phases of the first resurrection. The trumpets. The vials. I can go on and on as the things that God has used to, but it was the Lord directing, feeding, bringing those ten pounds, that weight of revelatory truth. And it was there to set as a foundation for the bride to look at it for a while and to use that as a base, not as being the concrete that God can't move from it, but that God would also, after verse 13, uh, verse 14, I should say, verse 14 is the same problem that I read to you early when I started in Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. Those Pharisees, they studied back and forth. They even had schools of divinity for their day. They knew what Moses said, but they didn't too care too much what Daniel said. But it was in their writings they should have known after 69th week they should be waiting for a Messiah to come. And when he did come and he spoke, they hated him. Because you're not coming to our preconceived ideas and you're not coming the way that we think you ought to come. They were so indoctrinated in the past, they couldn't see the day they were living in. That's what's happening in verse 14. The citizens, those that should know that God was moving on 
in their minds, a lot of them believe, Brother Branham's got to come back and finish this. He's not. No way, no how. Because if he was to come to finish it, then God would have not needed an apostle as a statue of Brother Jackson or a fivefold ministry. We would just be waiting for Brother Branham. Well, that was not God's purpose. Because you can't test that movement of Brother Branham's day because they see him, they know it's him right off the bat. You don't even have to be spiritual. But as God moves from one vessel to another, it's hard to recognize it when God has one on ground. All right. But here's the point. Verse 13 is from 1963 or 67 for Brother Jackson till 2004 or 2005 when he passed away. Now we're looking at a parable. But the parable doesn't stop there. Verse 15, I'm going to read on. And when it came to pass, when he was returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to be called unto him and gave the money that he might know how, many, how much every man has gained by trading. And, the first, and then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound, what pound? The pound that was, del- from the pound that was delivered, from 63 down to 2005 or 4, has gained 10 pounds. Where is this gain being produced? After 2005 or in 2005 onward. How many can see the parable? The Lord's come, he delivers the pounds, ten pounds. And he says to occupy those things. And as time moves on, he explains the condition while those pounds were being delivered, that those of his citizenship of that country that he came from, which is where the the Spirit of God is, 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 is being administered or present, presented, these hated it. In time. Because when God moves on to the next. Or from the days of Brother Branham. But now as the pounds has been delivered. The job's done. Now servants are going forth. One has takes one pound. And there's an increase. That tells me from the second watch into the third watch. There would be more revelation to come. From the first watch, as we reach the second watch here, from 1963 till the bride leaves, you're in the carcass of Matthew 24, verse verse 29. It spans those watch. The third pull. Did not start in 48 or 47. It started in 63. The third pull goes on till all journals watches. You could bring in at the same time the fullness of the Gentiles being brought in. That's concerning the people that would come in. Now the fullness of the Gentile is concerning the Gentile. No longer is God pulling in denominational churches. Because that leads you to Luke chapter 21, verse around 25, where it says, when you see Jerusalem no longer occupied by the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles is over. But Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, now we're living in the fullness of the Gentile. But the fullness of the Gentile is for what? It's those that God's bringing in into that room that he's schooling for the bride. And that's is also spread, spread, uh, spanning 
the space of time from the second watch up to the third watch. Because when those, all those things, whether it is the third pole, whether it is the, you know, the carcass or the bringing in the fullness of the Gentile, when it comes to a close, that bride is made ready and she gets married. Down here, you don't look too happy about being married. <laughs> All right. So when's the, the bride getting perfected? She's being in the process of perfection now. And in this third watch, we'll bring things a little closer to home now. In about the season, somewhere between the miracle war and the building of that temple, the bride will have reached her final revelation for her dress to be made ready. The thunders are instructions to give her more information when the Lord is actually coming. Because when we reach that miracle war, as we were looking at centuries and decades, the last century's gone by. We're in what's called decades. Like I mentioned last week, if you look at 1948, when Israel became a nation, and that would be people that would be 20 years of old, average, at that time. When you're looking at the lifespan of a person, you're not looking centuries. Now, I know there was on, on, on the news here locally, there was one person, 116. That's one. But billions are not. And so, in their lifetime, the Lord, in Psalms, he talks about, that man's years will be two score, uh, three score and, two, and ten, 70 years. So 24 from 70, that gives you 50 years in which God could be using or working in, which means 50 years is decades, right? But that generation, see, 1948, is all but passed away now. And so I know... and. And you hear it once in a while, well, I believe what Brother Branham said, what Brother Jackson says, was 1948, that generation there will not pass away. Or they don't know for sure how to, to look at it. Well, when Jesus says it in that parable of Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, concerning of the fig tree, when it puts forth a branch, that's 48, and puts more leaves, that's 67. Then you know... It's at the door, and that's the last generation. So if it's not, because time has took out of the picture 1948. Time has took out of the picture Hosea 6 and 2 of 2004 and a half, right? We're beyond that. I mean, we, you, you can believe in, in imaginary things you like. You can believe that the moon's made of green cheese, but 2004 ain't coming back. And so 48, 1948, that is also passed by the wayside. Now you're looking at 60, 1967. That's your and my generation that's living here right now. And it's in, because it's our generation and we've gone on some time, we've gone a few decades. But when we arrive at the miracle war, we know it's the last decade, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, when I say it's the last decade, that don't mean it has to be 10 years. But within that decade, all these things should be fulfilled, and we're going up in a rapture. We're going to be married to the Lord down here. And we're going to be made ready. We can get so involved in our personal life concerning the basic doctrines of salvation, but if we don't have that wedding garment up, you're not going nowhere. 
It takes both. The life and the revelation. And I, that clock is not true because it keeps, it's out of time. I have to. So I don't go too far burn your dinner or something like that. So we're living in now, in the last decade before we go up. Uh, go up here, sorry. But in this last decade, when Jesus comes off that mercy seat, and I know some are leery about what's been presented concerning that space of that half hour. If you're listening by the way of the internet, I'm not saying how long that half hour is. But if we can't identify when it starts, you're in trouble. And if you can't identify when it ends, you're still in trouble. And things that are happening in it, during that space of time, then we need to know. So when Jesus comes off that mercy seat and that angel of Revelation chapter 10 comes on the scene, that starts that half hour silence. And you here you've heard me say many times, it's not silence, it's <gasps> can't speak a word. No. It's revelatory silence because Jesus is not sitting on that throne no more. And another thing, well, might as well go for the ball of wax here. Ever heard that expression before? Well, it may, it may be just here in Canada for it. Anyway, I mean for the whole thing. Brother Branham has always said, Gabriel will introduce us Jesus' first coming, and Gabriel will introduce us Jesus' second coming. But Brother Jackson never said that. Yes, he did. But they never put it into a contender. But you can listen to the audio tape. 1999 06 09 is the time of the seasons, part four. At the, I'm going to help you even to find it if you, if, you, if you don't want to wait to listen through a whole hour. At the 73 minute, on after that, Brother Jackson says it's Gabriel. Where. He says, they can't accept what the thunders, how can they accept when Gabriel comes? Uh, when, about that time. They can't understand what, what God brought in this hour. There's other place he gives indication towards it, but he didn't feel comfortable, if you want to, in saying that angel of Revelation chapter 10 is Gabriel. And that takes the myth of those that are trying to portray that that angel is Jesus Christ himself. I'd have to bring in again what was dealt with a long time ago. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, Jesus never, never took on the nature of angels. But an angel can take on the, if you want to, the characteristics of Christ and speak on his behalf. And if you think that's troubling you, then you not have read Ex Exodus 23, verse 20, that's where God says, I sent my angel to speak to you, and you better listen to his words. If an angel could speak for God himself, then an angel can speak for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that rainbow that's coming about, that's the anointing of God, that's on that throne that is in chapter 4 and 5, that's coming down to you and I. You ain't going to be quiet then, I can guarantee you that. But somewhere when this bride comes to her completion, over here, after that miracle war, somewhere in that area, God's going to move something on our behalf. We can't put a, a, dime's worth of, a dime worth of prayers and have God says, now you've got to honor this. Remember, it's his program, not ours. 
There's a difference between demanding and ask. What is prayer? It's asking. And faith takes substance with the prayer. And if that substance is there, you can say, Thus saith the Lord. But in the meantime, if God wills certain things, we must walk on with him. I don't mean to put it that way, but look at reality in the past. I know from the early times when he came in this message, well, just have faith. Just, it's just like climbing, into, like Brother Jackson would say, like climbing, climbing into a bucket and try to lift yourself in the bucket. You don't generate it from your own efforts. There has to be that substance that comes from the Spirit of God that does these things. And when that comes, well, what's a, well, how come? It, well, have we spent time with Him to have that substance? Oh my goodness, time fleeing. I shouldn't have went there. Maybe. Tear's been hanging on even to 20, well, I might as well say 2017 we're living in now. That Antichrist spirit is still around. I don't know, I'm not saying that it's a revelation. But I feel in my being this morning that as Israel has to go to war to have her established in the land, it looks very much to clean the last remaining of unbelievers, make-believers, and tares that may be hanging on to the bride. There's going to be a spiritual warfare. And war is not having cake and, oh, it's so nice, we'll go for lunch. No, things are going to be said harsh. Warfare is harsh. Nobody likes war. Lord, please change your program. Don't make it a war. Who are we to tell him how to clean his church? I'm not looking forward. I'm looking forward to come to completion, perfection. But I'm not looking if, if there has to be a war in order to accomplish it, spiritually speaking. And if it is that way, somebody's going to have to speak loud enough. Like Brother Jackson says, forceful enough. And they're not going to care who's going to hurt or whose name it is. Otherwise, this will drag on way beyond, even in the week of Daniel, if, if it was never dealt with. I'm just preparing you. Somewhere, if we're living from 1967, and we be that generation that's going to see the rapture, we're getting old. We're getting near that last decade. And if we get to that last decade, something's got to happen. And if he wants this church to be in operation like it was in the book of Acts, the only difference is she's now dressed with a whole lot of revelation. But as far as living and acting and being God's children that somewhere something over here has to transpire. Something has to shake us. Oh, well, we're being shaken. We, we heard a tough sermon Sunday. My goodness. It's going to take more than that. How is it going to unfold? I don't know how it's going to unfold in, in, in these things that have taken place, but it will be taking place. When the Lord has brought something on ground and it be his voice, it identifies the believer that enjoys it. 
but they also identify as those that don't like it. And you can hear it in their expressions and how they look at things. Now, I want to temper that with this. But God's giving us space of time that we all get to see the same thing. And if we're not getting to the place where we're seeing the same thing, God's going to remove them. And how does God remove? Well, what I observe in the past, as he might be dealing with few here and there, when you see somebody new coming in, yes, God can add to the numbers, but sometimes it's a sign somebody's about ready to leave. Well, I didn't want to hear that. I want to hear something joyful. Joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, it does. It will, after we've gone through a war and, and, and the beatings and everything that takes place, when the bride's finally finished and, the, and then we're ch- going to be changing a twinkle of an eye, there'll be joy. I'll guarantee you that. Now, uh, can I finish this for a, m- a moment or two? So the half hour silent begins with that angel of Revelation chapter 10. He's coming for you and I, it's for to the living. And during that time, Jesus is off the mercy seat. That's why there's no, nothing prophetic taking place. But is there scripture that shows when that half hour silence ends? Yes, there is. It's in Revelation 8 and 3. And Revelation 5 and I believe 18, somewhere around that area. You find in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, if you want to turn to it just to read it, so, so I'm not pulling this out of thin air. And another angel came and stood at the altar. Oh, there's something. Oh, I got another. Things just been... I just before I get ready into this, when Gabriel came the first time to announce Jesus' first coming, he came to Zechariah. He was in the temple doing his priestly function. It wasn't a service. He was ministering, and he was at the altar of incense. And when Gabriel came, he stood on the right hand. Oh, that's left on the right hand side. That's my right hand side here. He stood on the right-hand side of the altar where Zechariah was. Reading in between the line, Brother Branham said in a, in a number of times, he says, when that angel comes and he's here to minister to the people, he always stands at my right-hand side and he knows to leave it there. Can you see the profile? Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're going to read Revelation 8, verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and was given him much incense that he should offer it with, and I know I said it before, it's very important, A L. L, all saints, the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. Here, because when, you, when Jesus comes off that mercy seat and we have the thunders and so forth and we're going to be praying like we never prayed before during that period of time before we leave this earth because we pray down here, you're not going to be praying in heaven. How I many you know you won't be, God won't require you to pray in heaven anymore? No prayers on our part will be required. So now this angel is offering the prayers of all the saints. But when we go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 8,
And when he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials, full of orders, which is the prayers of the saints. Here's the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 5. They all have their bowls, the 24 of them. They have the bowls of all the prayers of who they've represented. But they're never offered in chapter 5. They're just holding them there. Till God's plan has come to completion. That's why in Revelation chapter 8 verse 3, this angel now offers all the prayers, all those of the 24 bowls, and all those that we are going to pray down here, because otherwise if it was just the 24 bowls, then they wouldn't be all the prayers. So that tells me when the last prayer is prayed, we go up to meet the Lord in the air. That ends that silence of revelation that had been coming from the throne. Revelation didn't stop in the sense that we are going to get it with the angelic being that's going to be revealing to us here on earth. That's what's happening. Does that tell you how long it's going to be? No. But it tells you there is a start and there's a finish to this. And the key, the start, it's, it's easy, it's easy, it's been real long time ago. But when it finishes, it has to do with that angel at the altar of incense. Now he's going to offer all the prayers, all of the 24, plus what the bride has been praying during that silence, because that ends it. Because when you and I pray the last prayer, we're going up in a rapture. Does that make sense to you this morning? Yeah. Well, we don't know. It's just your ideas. Stick around. We're going to find out. This is going to get heated. And as it gets heated, it's going to expose those that are contrary to what God's doing. And it's not, it's the Lord directing as these things are coming now, coming forth in the hour that we live in. My goodness, 12.50, too long. All right, enough for this morning. There's other things that... Uh, this message would take quite a few sermons to, to finish it out, but I just thought I'd bring a little bit more detail on what we spoke about concerning last Sunday. Let's just stand at this time. Lord, I realize the time is late. Lord, you're the only one that can paint the truth and the picture. And Lord... Give us eyes have to see, Lord, as you bring us closer to our going home to be with you. Now I commit this service in your hands. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I have the musicians to come. If someone has a need, we'll, we'll sing one and then go from there. Thanks, thanks, I give you thanks for all you have done. I am so blessed, my soul has found rest. So blessed, my soul has found.
Just stand at the time. Brother Mike, dismiss us in a word of prayer. Bless each one.